Second time's a charm. Chandrayaan 3 makes India the first country to reach the moon's southern pole. Artificial intelligence takes the pressure off. Finding a near-Earth asteroid has now gotten twice as fast. And Australia's three space launch providers have news to share. From a multi-year deal at ELA to permanent facility approval at Southern Launch and streamlining technology integration at Gilmore Space. It's Thursday, August 24, 2023. Welcome back to Talking Science. I'm Matt Miller. Celebrating 20 years of Trekzone, this is Trekzone's Talking Science. This is the podcast where you get the science and space headlines now. India has become the first country to land in the moon's southern pole this week. Chandrayaan 3 touched down for a soft landing on August 23 and will now spend two weeks looking for frozen water, which the first Chandrayaan detected with a NASA instrument. This is the second soft landing attempt, first successful, and comes just a week after the failed attempt of Luna 25 by Russia. Equatorial Launch Australia has signed a multi-launch contract with Korean aerospace company Innerspace. The five-year deal will see payloads from 50 kilos to 500 launch from the Arnhem Space Centre on the Gove Peninsula in Australia's Northern Territory. Innerspace is home to the only hybrid fueled rocket to, be, to have successfully launched into space so far and becomes the first resident launcher at ELA. For more, General Manager of Operations and Launch at ELA, Ben Tett is beaming in. Ben, thanks for your time. Talk us through what this contract means for ELA, especially as it's the first. Thanks, Matt. Um, pleasure, and thank you again. Yeah, we're really excited here at ELA um, to have locked in our kind of tenant client, um, whereby they come and look to launch um, payloads for their clients over many years with us. Um, we've got the 12th launch contract secured away within the space. And that looks to kind of progress uh, with them from their smaller size rocket, um, the Henbit Nano, up through to the Henbit Mini over a number of years from 25. And so we're really excited about this. Now you've had three successful, albeit weather interrupted sounding rocket launches last year. How much bigger is the con is this contract with Innerspace? Oh, it's huge in a couple of ways. One, um, technically it, it is quite different from the, the NASA launches where we had um, then uh, in 2022, this moves to a, a bit of a liquid or hybrid component. And so we're doing a lot of work currently with the Australian Space Agency to lift all of our operational documentations to support, you know, liquids of, of varying numbers. We're not just um, in a space, but hopefully some other clients as well, as well as this one versus the NASA ones looks to put something into space, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, where the NASA's ones were sounding rockets and they came back down after uh, con conducting the scientific experiments. And that first sounding rocket, I have to mention it, Brad Tucker, former Talk and Science co-host, uh, his excitement, his exuberation in that first one. It's only going to be bigger uh, when we get the first inner space launch, isn't it? It is, yeah. No, we're really excited. And I think hopefully, we're, you know, we've been doing a lot of work around around the world, touring around and meeting all of our clients, the launch companies, um, and, you know, putting this one in, into the bank and, and putting it into our forward order book. Um, we'll help give it hopefully a bit of FOMO and, and start to sign up some others and shortly going to Christmas. Very cool. Now, I've spoken with Lloyd and the team at Southern Launch uh, a few times about access to polar orbit and how we're in a unique spot here in Australia. But equally as important is equatorial launch, which our space industry, and you guys in particular, can provide with a lot more climate stability than, say, French Guinea and uh, even Cape Canaveral. Yeah, no, we're excited. You know, the main strategic positioning, I guess, of AS ASC, the Arnhem Space Centre and ENT, was obviously a couple of things. Um, taking advantages of the, the services that are offered from Null and Boy, um, the proximity to the equator, which gives us that extra velocity bonus when you launch towards the equator um, inclinations, um, as, as well as kind of the obviously the lower population densities in the Northern Territory going out over the Cape of Carpentaria. So we really think that provides the advantage uh, some of these companies are looking for um, that, that really only French Guiana can do. Um, and we also think, you know, w we will be able to go through sun synchronous as well, kind of over land once these, these rockets become a bit more reliable. Now, how soon can we expect to see launches uh, of inner space from Arnhem Land? Yeah, we're looking to um, now get into the project details with them in the next couple of months on what their, their payload client is asking for them and where they want to put that um, satellite into orbit. And then that'll segue into a project with them when we finalize their engineering work. Uh, we start to work with the space agency and inner space on their launch permit. Um, and that will all bring us together, I guess, hopefully for a launch in the first quarter of 2025. 
Very, very exciting, Ben. Looking forward to that. Looking forward to staying in touch with Equatorial Launch. Uh, yeah. As I was saying off air, we now have our tricumbrate of launch providers here in Australia yeah. uh, in the Bank of Talk and Science. So really appreciate your time and looking forward to what's ahead. Pleasure, Matt. Anytime. Um, looking forward to it. Artificial intelligence has discovered its first asteroid. The algorithm, called HelioLink 3D, was programmed to hunt for near-Earth space rocks by researchers attached to the upcoming Vera C. Rubin Observatory in northern Chile. With the aim of aiding their 10-year survey of the night sky, the 180-metre-wide asteroid, uh, asteroid even has been designated 2022SF289. And joining me to discuss this find is Ari Hines, one of the research team at the observatory. Ari, thanks for your time. I know how incredibly difficult it is to find asteroids, let alone ones close by, ironically. So what does this AI discovery mean? Well, it means that uh, we've proven the unique uh, algorithm that's needed to enable the new uh, Vera Rubin Observatory that's uh, set to start survey observations in uh, Chile and South America starting in 2025. And this survey uses a unique uh, observation strategy um, that isn't compatible with current asteroid discovery algorithms. So we needed a new algorithm. Uh, and this discovery proves that the new algorithm works in a, in a realistic context and actually discovers a real asteroid. Now we say near-Earth object because it is, but so far there's no reason to suspect, suspect that we're in danger from 2022 SF-289, is there? That's correct. Uh, in the foreseeable future, it poses no threat to the Earth. Over a very long period of time where we can't predict the orbits, um, it could it could uh, hit the Earth in a million years or something like that. But now that we know uh, it's out there, um, we can we can track it, we can keep uh, keep an eye on it. But for the next hundred years, which is the the range when we can uh, predict the orbits with good accuracy, it, it poses no threat. Uh, how does the AI algorithm do things better than the human eye? Well, that's an interesting question. It is um, a, a new algorithm that uses sophisticated math. It isn't AI in the narrow sense of actually helping a computer to learn. Um, so it's it's deterministic in, in the sense that um, it does a specific set of math that connects observations on one night with observations on subsequent nights and figures out that they belong to the same asteroid. So that's that's the key. And I was reading too that the difference is that uh, humans kind of need four nights of observing, the AI can do it in two. Yes, that isn't so much a difference between humans and uh, the new algorithm as between uh, the old algorithm and the new algorithm. Uh, so all of the, the existing algorithms uh, do require four images per night. Well, how soon until the Vera C. Rubin Observatory comes online and its decade long mission begins? It's set to begin regular survey operations in 2025. Uh, we hope that actually about a year from now, uh, it will uh, be fully assembled and we'll be able to start testing it and um, basically tuning it up. Uh, so it, it'll be sort of a, a ramp up to full survey operations over a period starting about a year from now and, and lasting something like a year uh, after that. And it's a mammoth task ahead to find all these asteroids in the solar system. Uh, it's not just like it was in our in our textbooks in, in school of being just an asteroid belt. They're everywhere in the solar system, aren't they? That's right. Uh, specifically, the, the near-Earth asteroids, because uh, they they can approach Earth, they can appear on any side of Earth. Um, they're, they're not confined to the asteroid belt. So we have to uh, be prepared to look uh, all over the sky in order to find them. There's also uh, an aspect where we can only discover them when they come relatively close to Earth. And so there's there's a sort of um, uh, wait and watch aspect to this, where we have to watch for a long enough time in order to see all the asteroids uh, that are there. Well, good luck in the hunt, Ari. Looking forward to uh, more discoveries uh, like this. Thanks for being into Talk Insights today. Thank you. New research from Swinburne University in Melbourne highlights cutting-edge materials that could hold the key to new space discoveries. From micrometeorites and electromagnetic interference to fires and extreme temperatures, space is a dangerous place and we need to develop new materials to enable the next generation of space travel.
And to the smart folks at Swinburne Uni who have developed self-healing polymers, fire and thermally resistant materials, as well as materials for thermal management and those that even self-clean. Plus EMI shielding materials and multifunctional carbon fiber composites. Dr. Nissa Salim from Swinburne Uni says the research serves as a catalog of innovative materials that hold the promise of transforming space exploration. Well, Mercury's magnetic field generates aurora just like Earth's northern and southern lights, according to international researchers who say that the mechanisms behind how aurora are formed may be universal in the solar system. The team used data from a flyby mission of Mercury and found that the planet's southern magnetosphere, aurora, are similar to those seen on Earth and Mars. The magnetosphere is the region around the planet dominated by its magnetic field and is known to experience rapid reconfigurations which happen following interactions with the solar wind and often result in aurora similar to those observed around Earth and Mars, as I said, Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus. Well, Southern Launch and the Kniba Community Aboriginal Corporation will begin work on Australia's first permanent commercial suborbital space launch facility after planning consent was granted for the Kniba Test Range. It's one of the largest commercial rocket testing facilities in the world and is jointly operated by the Kniba Community Aboriginal Corporation and Southern Launch. The range is used to launch suborbital missions to the edge of space to conduct experiments and validate space technology. The range can also be used to accept re-entry of space technology from orbit. The development of permanent facilities will be an iterative process with the first stage focused on a launch pad and storage facilities. Well, Gilmore Space Technologies has announced it will use cutting edge solutions from the Siemens Accelerator portfolio of industry software to digitally transform its design and manufacturing processes across its Queensland facilities. The use of this design and product lifecycle management software will help to increase cross-functional collaboration through unified digital frameworks across various areas such as launch vehicles, satellites, launch site operations and research and development. It will also enable increased design accuracy and quality across large assemblies supporting complex design management between different vehicle stages. Well. All of that said, we are podcasting on YouTube and across every podcast app. Find each of Trexone's shows on Google or Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, tuned in and more. Plus, Trexone's channel in the iTunes library gives you a one-stop shop for all of our goodness. So jump onto your favorite podcast app, find Trexone and subscribe. On YouTube, membership continues to be available, early access for less than a cup of coffee per month. And of course, on Facebook and Instagram with the week's podcast highlights. This is our 20th year to the world. We are Trekzone. I am Matt Miller, talking science, back after a month off. Very much looking forward to the rest of this year. Plenty of exciting stuff coming up. We have been going boldly since 2003.